Hey, MG Cop. Um, before I get started, I do want to say this presentation starts going badly. Maybe someone else has already said this, but you should just type pizza into the chat. Save us all some little bit of time now. My name is Anthony Humes. Um, I am an engineer for a company called Simple File down here in Provo, Utah. And if there's one thing that you need to know kind of about me, or at least that I love, is the fact that I'm a self-taught engineer. Um, so about five, six years ago, I really did not like my job in marketing. Um, so I graduated in. So I started to look for some, some differences and some changes. And this Angular has just become one of those things that I just love to learn about and to teach and to talk about. So what I want to do is I want to start off today just by talking a little bit about a story. So when I was first an engineer, what I did is I did um, WordPress development. Now that's just basics, bare bone, almost nothing really to it. Um, and yet, as time progressed, I wanted to do more. So a client came to us and said, hey, I want to do a custom website. Now, at the time, we should have just done a WordPress website. But what ended up happening is I was like, hey, you know what, let's do something different. And I convinced my boss that, you know, we should take this risk and, and jump in and do some new things, some different stuff. So I did some research online, trying to Anthony, find a new solution that would be Anthony, work well. Yeah. I need you to figure out how to be a little bit louder. You're a little soft on the stream. Sorry, bro. No, no worries. Is that any better? Really close. Uh, it, can you turn it up on your mic a little bit? It's a little bit better. Is that good? Are you using? No, I don't think you're using the right one in Zoom. I did, but I will switch mics. So. Is that any better? Hello, can you guys hear me still any better? That's better. That's perfectly fine with me. Okay. So no worries. Thanks, Aaron. So as I was saying, what we did is we ended up picking this new thing, or at least this new thing to me, called Ruby on Rails. And we picked a new database of Postgres, and we picked a brand new front end to make it things a little more snappy called Backbone. Now, for me, I was like, this is awesome. This is really good. And I was like, you know what? I totally have this. Everything's going to be awesome. Don't know anything about these, but I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to do it. And this is going to rock. So what happened? Well, we started this journey. We went and months went by of development and I had my own office. I was building things. It all felt really cool and I really enjoyed it. But then little cracks started to show where the just trying to figure out how things were breaking and what they were doing kept on becoming worse and kept on be, having more and more problems. Well, finally, when I was in, it was Christmas time, I was in Disneyland with my family and I found myself working 40 hours in Disneyland. And what ended up happening was I learned that this project had basically failed. It was an absolute and utter failure. And it wasn't just like a small one. It was such a failure that the client ended up going out of business and I ended up having to find a new job. And what did I... I kept on asking, trying to ask myself, why did this happen? And what ended up happening was when critical production issues arose, it was hard to debug them. And that cost us so much time and money and issue after issue. And what I learned was that I wasn't using even the basic debugging tools. I didn't know how to use breakpoints in Ruby. I wasn't writing any kind of unit tests. And I wasn't, I never even opened up to Chrome developer tools. So from this, what can we learn? Well, to build good apps, you must be able to define to debug them effectively. But not just that, to debug effectively, you must be able to use all of your available tools. So that leads us to this new API inside of Angular. And what happened was, we, for me, what I learned about this was that we had a senior engineer come and ask me, where did ng-probe go? And honestly, I went ahead and I said, well, let me get back to you. And I went to Google and I typed in, what is ng-probe? And I did some research and I ended up finding just a single small blog article about it. And I went back and I said, oh, there's these new methods in Angular, but that wasn't good enough. And I needed to find out what was, how did they work and what were they? So I ended up doing some more research by reading the source code and kind of getting a feel for it. And I ended up learning that these come directly from Ivy internal methods. And that was like amazing and just totally made me, I was like, okay, so this is something that Ivy itself is using. So the first question we have to ask ourselves if we're going to use these new methods is, well, hey, where do I get them? So if I go to the console and I type in 
just ng into the um, into the console, I'm going to get a new set of methods. Um, and these are the methods that we can use for this debugging API. Now, before we start, we have to ask ourselves, um, I, I have to explain a little bit about this dollar sign zero. You're going to see both um, as we walk through the rest of the slides and as we do the demo. Now, dollar sign zero, it's the most recent selection from the elements inspector or from using the inspect element. So when you select that element and you select and you open up the developer tools by saying inspect element, and you, to, if you type in dollar sign zero, you're going to get a reference to that element in the console. So we can see that here, if I select this paragraph and I type in dollar sign zero, I'm going to get that reference there. Now, the first set of APIs that I kind of want to walk through are going to be kind of getting Angular elements. So these are going to be getting Angular um, uh, components, directives, and listeners. So let's walk through each one of these and see a little bit more about what some use cases might be for them. So the first is going to be ng.getComponent. Now, what it does is that it retrieves the component for an HTML element. So if you've seen the HTML tag for that is referencing your element, um, if, you type, if you were to select that and type in ng.getComponent, it's going to return that. And this is super useful for checking what's the state of my app at any moment in time. So I can say, okay, well, what is the state? What is that current class instance? On top of that, if I do... Um, and it's really helpful for testing like third party components. So if I've got something like AG Grid or um, NGB Bootstrap and I want to actually see what's the state of some of their components, I can go ahead and I can um, type this in and get that state. Now, directives, if you type in ng.get directives, it's going to retrieve an, um, an array of directives for any HTML element. Um, and this is super useful for seeing which directives are affecting an element. So sometimes you'll have directives that are affecting an element through standard attributes. And it's not always clear how it's being affected. And so you can debug and say, hey, what stuff is actually approaching, uh, is, is being done on this. So the, um, and finally here, ng.getListeners. What it does is it returns both an array of HTML and host listeners for an HTML element. And this is really useful for when you want to trigger your listeners without actually running through the action. Because we've done listeners with scroll events, and for us, there's a lot of times where I just want to see what happens when I give it a specific scroll event and I end up trying to scroll up and down just to get that event to happen perfectly where now I can test that. So let's show an example of this. So if I go ahead and I say I want to select this app child and I type in ng.getComponent, I'm going to receive that component instance. And this is going to be really helpful for testing things in isolation, like checking the specific instance of an item inside of an ng4 loop where I can say, hey, what is the actual data that's being provided here. Now, once we have this instance, the next thing that we can do with it is we can actually make changes. And the, this method, ng.applyChanges, allows us to trigger change detection for that specific component. So if we go ahead and we look at this and say, um, you know, I want to say, okay, I'm selecting this component. I type in ng.getComponent. I change the value. I run ng.applyChanges my actual value in my HTML is going to get updated. And this can be really helpful for testing when I make changes, well, what actually occurs from that. But it's also very helpful for debugging change detection issues. So if you're thinking you're having change de detection issues, you can go into your app, you can select the element that is having problems, and you can run a, manually run a change detection um, cycle on that element. Now, a couple of other methods here that are um, that are kind of important are going to be like ng.get owning component and ng.get context. So um, get owning component, it's just like the get component, but it can be used on any element and it returns the parent component for that HTML element. So it runs, it traverses the HTML DOM and finds the closest parent element that is an, a, that is a comp, an Angular component and returns to you that instance. That's very helpful if what you're seeing is things like paragraphs and that kind of stuff. Now ng.get context, what it does is that, is that it returns the context for like an ng-if or an ng-4 for an HTML element. So if you're seeing a, an array of items or like a list, you can actually use this to get some insight into what the ng-4 um, is actually doing inside of that element. Now, um, a couple of other methods. These are just uh, ng.get root components and ng-get um, injector. Um, we don't have enough time to really go over them in any depth, but they're going to... Um, retrieve some, um, retrieve just like what your base root component is that's been bootstrapped by Angular, as well as um, getting the injector for a specific component. Now, 
Before we do our demo and talk a little bit about this, I want to talk about what these APIs won't really do, how they probably won't help very much inside of your code base. So the first thing is, is, that, they're, is that they don't really replace using breakpoints in Chrome. They're an addition to that. Um, and you're still going to find yourself needing to use breakpoints to be able to see how specific methods and actions are actually working inside of your components. Um, they also don't really work very well to the bug interactions between components. So if I've got one method that, you know, I've got a bunch of components that are all kind of relying upon a central service, it's not really going to be very helpful for me to do um, some of that. Now, sometimes it can be, but it's a lot of times where it's not going to be helpful for that. The other thing that it won't be really helpful for is debugging complex state issues with observables and NGRX. If you're running one of these, um, like observable store or NGRX, this won't be probably the thing that can help you kind of detect um, beyond just looking at what the state of the components are, how the actual flow is is being created, how the actual state's being created. And finally, it's not going to magically fix every problem in your app. Um, just like anything, it's a tool. It's a tool that goes into our tool belt that we can use to make things hopefully much um, easier um, by using all of our tools on our tool belt. So one last thing before the demo, um, we have a note from the Angular team, and we asked them about this. They wanted us just to make certain that, that you knew that this is a this current API, it's a work in progress. These methods, they're just kind of the starting point for a way more powerful set of debug tools because they wanted to really replace the NG probe with a much better set of debug tools. So you should expect in the future to see more methods, better functionality, and they're just going to continue to make this API much more powerful. So let's go ahead and let's walk through our demo. Um, I'm going to switch screens really quick. So if you can... Um, uh, Look at this. So I want you to imagine that we're a brand new engineer and are to a company, and we're being given this app to kind of look at. And we want to investigate its functionality, not just look at its code, but just kind of guess, look at how it's actually working. So let's look right here at this page title. So if we inspect this, I can come here. I can see that I have an H3 element. Now, because I'm not selecting a um, uh, um, an actual component in Angular, I can do get owning component. And I can pass in and say, hey, you know what? It's just giving me the title component that is that is attached to this app title element. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to call that. And what I'm going to do is you can look and see, hey, the property inside of this component, there's a title. And it's equal to page title. So if I want to, let's say, change that, I can do get owning component. Or I can do title. And I can change that to something like, Hey, ng-conf, and run it. Now, if I check my component, I can see that its title has been updated to hey, ng -conf. But, of course, you'll notice that the actual inside of my element, nothing's changed, or inside of my um, app, nothing's changed. So I want to run the end, I want to run the, um, uh, um, the change detection for it. So I can do ng-apply-changes. I'm going to pass in ng-get-owning-component. I run that again, and then, hey, we see that there's been a change. Now, again, this is going to be really helpful for debugging specific instances where you think the variables might be set incorrectly, and if you change them, you can you can have an update and some change. Um, you can see how that works. So um, another use case for this kind of behavior that we've seen in, in, in my company as well as in my own code that's really helpful is when I want to debug some third-party library where I don't actually have access to the source code. And I want to be like, hey, I'm debugging this other person's code, this other person's app, um, and I want to see how is it affecting my code. So I can come up here. So if we look at this, I'm using a directive from Angular Bootstrap, and you can see that we have ngb nav. This is just a directive on this um, uh, this list element. So if I do ng dot get directives, we can see that I'm getting a list of directives. And we can see that one of them is ngbnav, the only one really. Um, so let's go ahead and let's select that item. Now, so for, if you're looking at this, you can see this is the, the instance at this moment in time for that specific class. So there's a, a bunch of different properties on here. I'm gonna make a change directly to this component and see how that affects my app. So what I'm gonna, or this directive, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna say, and I'm going to change its orientation from horizontal to vertical. Now, again, nothing's changed because we're not, we're not, um, we haven't run our change detection. So we do 
apply changes, ng dot get owning component. Run it again. Hey, I've actually made a change to a third party directive outside of my own code in isolation, and I can see how that is affecting my app. So let's change it back. Oops, I better uh, actually change that. All right, so now I want to walk through a couple of more examples and instances where recently I've seen huge benefits in my old co own code as I've been debugging specific issues inside of the main app that I work on all day. So if we look at the advanced tab, I'm going to walk through this and just I'm going to explain this scenario a little bit. So recently what we did is that we had an instance where we had a list of items and when we would trigger an action, sometimes that list would be updated, but sometimes it wouldn't. And it wasn't 100% clear what was going on. I thought that it might be an issue to do with change detection, but it was hard for me to prove that it was an issue with change detection because there were some times with the exact same action where it worked just fine. So to tell my, you know, to say, hey, this is actually change detection, what I, um, I went ahead and I ran the, um, I went ahead and I, I ran the apply changes on it. So we'll do this here. So if I click this update list, nothing is happening. But if I hover over, oh, wait a second, holy crap, a whole bunch of stuff happened after I, I hovered over those elements. I can continue to do that where I make the change and then, hey, there's some, there's some stuff that's occurring. So let's go ahead and let's click update list. And you know what? What I want to do is that I want to select my, my list here. And so I'm going to select my list. And what I'm going to do is that I actually want to see how does, um, what does the ng.get context look like? So I'm going to, let's do this. So let's do ng, and I'm going to select a list item, ng.get context. I'm going to pass in the get context. Now what this is giving to me is this giving me the context for this specific element inside of my list. So you can see it's got some good information. Oh, hey, is it first? Is it last? Even odd? It also gives me what the item that it's being passed in to that um, list element is going to be, as well as, hey, here's the whole array and the index plus the total count. So if I go ahead and I click update list and I run this again, we can see that the index and the count are the same. And sorry, I don't think I clicked on it. Hold on a second what you get for having random stuff. But you can see that my ng4 is actually different now. Even though the index and count hasn't changed, the ng4, the array of stuff, has been altered. So if I say, you know what, I'm going to do ng apply changes, ng dot get owning component, and run it there, we can see now there's four items in my array. So I know for sure this is an issue that has been caused by um, uh, my change detection. So um, one last thing that I kind of want to look at is I want to look at how some listeners can hopefully benefit if we're looking at specific actions. So um, for me, if I click on this and I refresh my app a little bit, we can see, hey, when I hover over some of these items, they're changing. And if I click on these items, there's an action being um, that's firing from that. So let's go ahead and let's select this item three here. I'm going to inspect this. And what I'm going to do is on this paragraph, I'm going to do ng.getListeners. I'm going to get an array of listeners. I can see that the first one, it's a click handler. So I can go, all right, I want to look at the click handler. And for this element, what I'm seeing is that I have the name of the handler, what element it's attached to, a callback, and then a type. Um, and so for me, what I want to do is I'm like, hey, you know what? I want to trigger this callback outside of the normal flow of my Angular app, because maybe this callback um, isn't really easily addressed. I can't call it normally because of some L and because of some NGF or some other behavior. So, I, but I want to, you know, call it now. So let's go ahead and let's do that. So I'll do callback. Again, nothing's changed because we haven't run our change detection, but we can do that really easily by running the, um, that. We can see, hey, that item has changed. So I run it again. And then we can keep on seeing that I am making the changes in isolation one at a time to test very specific instances of how my code is running. Um, and then if we look at the item that's directly above it, this app list item, what I can do is that I can also call listeners on this one. Hold on one second. And I can see that I am getting an element 
And that element actually has a listener that is a mouse over element. And that's why when I'm hovering over these, even though this is a host listener that's attached inside of the code, I can see that, hey, that's the way that it's, um, I can see the actual callback that's occurring. Now, I want to go, I want to talk just finally um, about some of the next steps that you can take to hopefully make these API methods way more valuable to you in your everyday um, work. So first off, spend some time experimenting with these new methods. Um, look at them, try and figure out, well, how, how can I use them to debug my app? Because after I learned about them, I didn't use them for at least two to three months. It wasn't after a couple of months that I, and I, that I reached a problem where I was like, you know what, these things, these could actually help it. And the more that I've been using them, the more things that I've been finding have been very helpful for me um, to, uh, um, I've been using, seeing more and more use cases for them. Also, spend some time pair programming with another developer so that you're both looking at these codes and these elements. You can actually see how they are going to um, affect your code um, or affect your debugging. And then finally, help someone in the community with a problem that they can't solve. Um, because the more that we help and we step outside of ourselves and work with people who are struggling or are new to our community, the more that we can actually both um, grow the community and help everyone to be the bet kind of engineers that we want to be. Um, and I already said, that was double that, but always keep learning. And that's the final thing that I want to leave with you is the more, if we want to be an engineer who enjoys our job today, tomorrow, and in 10 years, and has a job today, tomorrow, and in 10 years, we need to never stop learning. We need to always move forward. We need to always be taking in the new things that are being developed and trying to figure out how they fit into our own app. Um, and finally, I just want to say thank you again for taking the time to uh, listen to me, and I hope this is helpful for all of you. Cool. 